everyone to be here. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. I Uh, it's such a tradition, there are so many hundreds of films with vampires in them, and uh, our film is not a horror film, so it, it's a different kind of vampire film, but there are many different not horror vampire films. Uh, one of the most earliest, most beautiful is uh, Vampire by Carl, Carl Dreyer. But uh, there are many, The Hunger from Tony Scott, there is... Uh, recent films like Let the Right One In, which I like very much. Um, Claire Denis made a film called uh, Trouble Every Day, Abel Ferrara's Addiction, uh, Nadja by Michael Amoreda. There, there are many vampire films that are not specifically horror movies. And uh, this film started quite some time back and it was uh, kind of a rough uh, journey to make it and uh, you seem a bit, I don't know, a bit disappointed of how filmmaking has changed, how hard it is to make the films you want. And I know that for years you you, you owned uh, the films you were making, you, you had the rights of your negatives and stuff like that, and this is the first time that you've done so. Uh, is it, um, I don't know, is it, do, you, do you find it harder? Do you uh, still have the strength to go on? And uh, what makes you feel powerful to continue? Uh, well, I love the form so much of uh, films. It's such a beautiful form, so... But it is getting very difficult, it's very different now than it was even five years ago to finance films, so... I don't know what to say about that, except to try to keep going. And um, there are many new films and new film directors in, in Greece now. You have a kind of new wave of new Greek cinema, so there are these gardens of cinema still growing around the world. Uh, your first, you did your first movie in 1918, some years have passed, uh, and in those years you've been transformed into uh, one of the most important American directors in the world cinema. So yeah, I'm not sure about that. Well, <laughs> in, in, in your last film there is this uh, line of dialogue uh, right before the end, where Adam and Eve are watching Jasmine yes, Hamdan perform this wonderful song, and uh, Eve says, oh, she's wonderful, and uh, I suppose she's, she must be really famous. And uh, Adam says, I hope she's not, because she's too good to be famous. So does that reflect on you? Do you feel a bit awkward about your status these days? Well, I was more saying that uh, for me, I think, always I've always found more interesting things outside of the mainstream. So the things sort of in the margins are often more um, moving to me. Uh, there are always, throughout history, there's always been a kind of mainstream culture and a kind of marginal culture. And uh, a lot of the most innovative things are in the margins. Not always, but for me, most often. And, and where do you see yourself in this? Uh... Oh, well, I'm definitely in the margins somewhere. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't see uh, myself in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. But there are other uh, people I respect very much who are much more courageous and uh, innovative in the way they use cinema that uh, break a lot more rules and move things that are more marginal than, than my work. But I greatly admire them. So, uh, if any of you has a question... Nothing in this film that I can consciously say I was making a direct reference to another film, but just the things they mention and talk about in the film as inspirations uh, for the characters are then inspirations for the film itself. So, and I, I don't know if steel was really the best word to use uh, whenever I wrote that, but my intention was that there really, really isn't uh, original ideas. The, the beauty of ideas is that they are like waves in the ocean and they connect with things that came before them. And I think it's very important to embrace things that interest you and influence you and incorporate them into what you do as all 
artists have done always. Uh, the ones that, don't, that say they don't are lying, I think, or are afraid that their work will not be seen as being original. Hi, um, this is a question with two parts. Um, first of all, what's your opinion for American independent filmmaking uh, currently? And has the uh, situation after the crisis led to a scarcity of funds that has caused a decline in it? And do you think a new wave might be needed to occur at some point? Um, and the second part is, uh, here in Greece we've learned to make future films lately with no budget. Uh, based on more, uh, in a different paradigm of filmmaking and uh, on the DSLR and new technologies. Uh, so, do you think this kind of know-how uh, could be useful uh, to the U.S. independent uh, filmmaking? Well, to answer the first part, or maybe not answer it, I, I don't really know. It depends on how you define independent cinema. And it's become a kind of, especially in America, almost a marketing tool. So I don't even know really what it means. But yes, things have changed, and uh, the worldwide economic crisis, and also the new ways of films being distributed, has changed the way they can be financed. So I don't know what is the future. I know that maybe the Greek new wave of Greek films, using small budgets, is really the future and the, maybe the best way. And if you look at the history of any form, but let's just say of rock and roll, for example, you find that it goes in cycles and there are cycles where, for example, when I was younger, um, we were tired of this big stadium rock and roll, right? And this record company, commercial, rock and roll forced in a way on you in a mainstream way. So there, it was very important that, for example, the, well, starting maybe with the Stooges, but when you have the, the Sex Pistols or the Ramones, the idea was reduce down to the essential thing. Don't worry that you're not a professional. And this is the future, I think, in a way, where cinema must be now is strip away everything. I'm much more interested in seeing a film by a Greek filmmaker that made a film for $200,000 than I am in seeing The Great Gatsby by Bosler. You know, so that's just my taste. But a cinema needs to maybe be reduced to its essential poetry. And this is a cycle that happens and we're in it now maybe forcibly by worldwide economics. Maybe, maybe that's a very good thing in a way. So maybe some very beautiful, already in, in Greece, in Romania, for years now in Iran, we have these beautiful gardens of new cinema that come in places you would think, well, how can they be making films in Greece where you can't, it's, the crisis is so, so severe. But yet here it is, you know, it's happening. So I don't know, I'm not a predictor, but I, I really embrace this, uh, people finding their own way to express themselves. So I have a lot of hope for it. You cannot kill these beautiful forms. You can just not help them with a lot of money. So. Okay, Mr. Zarmus, here, Where? right here. Oh. Right here. Okay, I would like to know why does your film take place in Tangier and Detroit? Is it the hidden symbolism behind those two cities in the sense that Tangier is a multicultural destination which attracted many authors like Jack Kerouac, William Burroughs, Truman Capote, and of course Detroit is a symbol of decline nowadays. And would you shoot a film here in Thessaloniki? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, you know, I'm not very analytical. I don't want to talk about the, really the symbolism of these cities. I think that's in the film. So what they mean, I place in the film. And I don't really feel so comfortable explaining it. Um, I thought they were appropriate places 
to define, help define these characters because really our film is not really a vampire film or a horror film. It's a love story with, it's a kind of character study. It's about the characters. So the places they live becomes very important and in defining them. And it is important that they're vampires because that allows them to have an overview of history over hundreds of years, which is part of the story as well. But also, and I love Detroit, and I love Tangier very much, so part of it is maybe was my wanting to be able to spend time there also. But uh, both of these cities have many qualities, and I could talk for hours about why I, I like them or what they mean in the film, but I, I prefer not to. And was there another part of it? Uh, oh, about filming here. Well, I, I've only been here a few days. I, I love it here, but I, I develop ideas pretty slowly. So I don't have a script written yet that takes place here. <laughs> but I'm very happy to be here, and this is really an amazing place. And I read, I started reading a lot of, about the history of Thessaloniki before I left to come here. and. Uh, really an incredible history and an incredible place and I'm so happy I'm really happy to be here so I you never know you know I'm, I'm absorbing things in my in my own way question on your left be like you have to find new ways of dealing with this is this a subject that <coughs> is in your mind when you make films uh, you know I I see that it is something that is in my films, but I don't consciously think about it so much. I, I don't really know how to answer that. I don't really analyze the films. I know that time is part of certainly a uh, um, mystery train and night on earth where things were happening uh, concurrently. And in this film, yes, time is very much a subject because these characters have seen history over a long period, so their perception is heightened, and uh, that's a theme in the film. But I can't be analytical about it. It's not my way. I don't think that way. Right. Hello. Um, since you said you study Greek history, hope you discover the real Macedonia, because many citizens of the uh, United States don't know about things about that. Uh, I would like to ask you, you said uh, you like um, underground music, so you must be sad by the recent death of Lurie. What was his music for you? What uh, means for you, Lurie? Well, you know, I, I've lived in New York for a long time. Lou Reed is like our kind of godfather of rock and roll in New York. And Lou Reed and the Velvets were groundbreaking. And at the time when the Velvet Underground first began, uh, you know, people hated this. It was noise. It was not even music to a lot of people. And yet now you see how pervasive the uh, inspiration and influence of the Velvet Underground and of course Lou Reed have been. For us in New York, it's uh, truly a big loss to, to lose uh, Lou, you know, so, but we don't lose him because he gave us so many amazing things, you know. I don't, I don't love all of his music, as I don't love everything every artist makes, but uh, I love a lot of Lou Reed's music and uh, it's extremely important to me. Um, we weren't close friends, but I, I knew him, I got to hang out with him, I had dinner with him a few times, and got to spend some time uh, talking with him, and uh, he was really, uh, was really, for me, a huge inspiration, Lou Reed. So, I say, long live Lou Reed. from Germany and France and some money trying to get from England and we did not have the last piece of financing to make our film and uh, and Christos came and allowed us to have to make this film so it, it was really like an angel um, I had met him before this and uh, when I uh, 
Bart Walker, who I work with, he helps me finance my films. He suggested, he said, there's a very interesting uh, Greek man who uh, is very, uh, potentially very important in the future of our kind of filmmaking. And he said, you, you know, would you like to meet him? And I said something like, Oh, so is this some like some Greek guy that just wants to go to parties and meet Paris Hilton? You know, I, I was quite rude to, to my friend Bart. He said, no, 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 this is a very different kind of man. This is a very interesting man. So I had dinner with Christos, and we were talking all night about our both our beliefs that that William Shakespeare is a total conspiracy, our love of Mark Twain our love of Lafcadio Hearn, our love of the city of New Orleans, our love of certain forms of music. And we were talking, talking, and this guy was so incredible. I was like, where did he come from? You know? So then when we were lacking money for our film, Bart said, well, maybe we should go to Christos. And I was like, well, I love this guy. I don't know, see, see what he thinks. And then he saved our film. But. Uh, this man is extraordinary, and his knowledge and interest in things is so great, you know. So he's like a, a wonderful gift to us all and to all of us for this new wave of Greek cinema that he is uh, very positive about. So, yeah, what an amazing man. So I, I'm ha so happy to be here, and Christos is here, so he is an angel among us. And another one I must just say, I must talk about Dimitri Adidas, because this man has been a kind of a figure, a guide, a navigator, a godfather of, of interesting cinema my whole life as a filmmaker. And just to be here with him, and I'm just, I, I would say this even if he's not here, th this man is a real gift to us all too. With him. So, but anyway, I have to say it because, well, I'm not. Many, many filmmakers that feel this way about Dimitri, and so it's not just, I'm not just saying this to be complimentary. I don't do that, but I um, sincerely respect. So we're among some real angels here, and I'm very happy, proud to be, um, and among all of you. So. Baz Lerman, no, no, because no. there are all, there are, there's a need for all types of cinema, you know, and there are some people make things on a small level, some people need a larger scale. For example, Terry Gilliam is not someone that works in a small way. And I love Terry Gilliam and I love his films. So, and I love uh, some mainstream things as well. But uh, in my life, only when I was first starting out and made Stranger Than Paradise, uh, I was offered a few kind of larger Hollywood projects. But they were like, I don't think that the people offering me these had seen my film. I think they only saw something about it in variety or because these were like coming of age, teenage comedy <laughs> things, very commercial. So I, 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 but since then nobody has offered me anything like that. <laughs> Dead Man for me is about life and death being something circular, being the same thing in a way. Um, this film, I think it's about uh, just for me, and again, I'm not good at analyzing my film. I don't, I don't really want to know what, what it's about exactly, but I, it's sort of mysterious to me. But I, I hope that it's, uh, part of it is to celebrate our gift of being conscious. Because if you look at the planet Earth and life on this Earth and how strange and unusual that is and in the expanse of the universe life on earth is just one tiny little flicker you know and yet we are in the middle of it and we're given this consciousness of being alive and being human beings so i, I think and i even think that uh only lovers left alive one idea i think is in the film is to be to celebrate this consciousness and the character of Eve is very strong about that and Adam is a little weaker he gets a little more romantic and uh, gets disillusioned by human behavior which I do as well but uh, 
I, I hope the idea is to celebrate consciousness and, and life and being alive. At the same time, I don't think I would want to be alive forever. Um, because I, I think death is part of a cycle. And uh, I think being alive, I'd like to live a lot longer. Well, you know what, um, once years ago in Cannes, my friend uh, Aki Karismaki, the Finnish director who I love, uh, they asked him, uh, he was giving a press conference and they said, Aki, how do you consider your films your place in the history of cinema? And he said, don't worry, history will draw a veil over all of this. <laughs> so, uh, I prefer to think that way. Well, I guess just being conscious, um, several things, you know, human imagination is a kind of one of the things I think the most beautiful things we have, and also just the physical presence of the earth and the universe and the moon and the sun and the air, and I, this sounds absurd, but I, I would have to just say these very general things, I, I don't know. I think I sort of answered that already, talking about the gift of consciousness. Really. Possible to list. Uh, you wouldn't be using that wireless microphone. We wouldn't have this uh, form of illumination or electric, uh, alternating electric current. Uh, we wouldn't have most things we take for granted came, came from Tesla's imagination. So uh, Tesla was, in the end, discredited. He was treated like a madman. He was exploited, he was, uh, they stole things from him, he was not given respect, ultimately. And uh, yet, he changed everything we think, the way we live, in every way. So, I find this very odd and unfortunate. But the main reason that, that we should remember that Nikola Tesla was discredited was because his real uh, concerns were free energy, for everyone, and that he wanted to find ways that would make warfare basically impossible, a kind of uh, shields based on particle acceleration, or what they call a death ray, whatever. But Tesla wanted no war, and he wanted free energy. And these are because of the uh, unfortunate, uh, now present, corporate uh, kind of almost crypto-fascism in the world. These things are denied to us, and yet they are fully possible. Why do we, we don't have to use these kind of fossil burning vehicles. There are all, many alternatives. Um, we don't, you know, we don't have to pay corporations for this energy. There are other ways this could happen, but the people, the, the small percentage that control all this wealth are uh, basically corporate and they have decided for us. So we should remember what Tesla wanted for us and, uh, and then look at what we have. And there's a big question, why this way instead of the other way? So he's very important to, to all of us of how we live, but also his, his ideas and ideals are very, very valuable. And, uh, have been discredited and exploited and uh, attempt to be forgotten. But he won't be forgotten. So.